Welcome, it's a very special conversation. I'm so glad to be here and to meet these two incredible women. We've had a lot of conversations on Mirror Now about the glorious judgment that came out of the Supreme Court regarding 377 being read down. Now we get to meet the people behind that fight, or some of the people behind yeah. that fight. Yeah. Yeah. Menka thank you so much. I, I know that it's a busy, uh, you know, it's a busy day for those in the legal profession in Delhi. So I'm so glad you made time for us. Thank you. For thank, you. Us thank you to sit down with us. And um, I mean, we actually read this in the Mirror Now uh, newsroom when it came out. And it's, it's, it's such a beautiful judgment. And you just feel so much hope yeah. about yeah. everything that's, right. that's, that's being talked about. And uh, right. you know, there are some things that meant a lot to me because some of my best friends are in the LGBT community mm -hmm. and you witness them go through a lot. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to talk to you about some of the nuances and what, what this meant for you. Uh, other than, you know, we've, the big conversations have, have already been had. Um, one of the things that really, you know, uh, that it sort of struck me was the constant mention of bullying, living in fear, not being able to sort of express your identity, not, you know, not having the freedom to be who you are and what that means, the implication of what that means. Which it really felt that these judges or this bench empathized yeah, yeah. with your petitioners. And I wanted to understand from you because you guys know best, what were the arguments or what were the testimony that you think allowed or helped the judges do that? Because this didn't happen the previous few times this went to court. There was a difference here. So what do you think, what was, that, what was the striking testimony or the striking argument that brought in that angle? You know, I think at a very basic level, simply having live petitioners in court Right, and having individuals as petitioners in court makes a huge difference. So um, there had been affidavits before this in the case, but the, the NAS petition itself had been brought by an organization. Um, and you'd had you know, uh, applications by parents or teachers and so on, but you'd never actually had LGBT people as mm -hmm. petitioners. And I think that really made a difference. You know, we started with five petitioners. Um, I think they were incredibly brave, but they had the, um, you know, the guts to come out with their stories. Because really you know, when, when these petitions came, petitioners came forward, and some of them were businessmen, they were all active members yeah. of, of business and society. Yeah. Yes. It's yes. dangerous to be a petitioner. Because Absolutely. Yeah, very much. You bet, yeah. right? So you it, bet. it is a yeah. brave thing to come forward. Yeah. And you said that you preferred doing it this way rather than a PIL, yeah. because then it's about the petitioner. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think that the, the, the thing that I have learned mm -hmm. from litigation right uh, and and doing you know constitutional litigation right um, is that you have to put the human being at the center mm -hmm. of the case right mm -hmm. um, I've said this before courtrooms are set up to tell stories it's a it's a space to tell the stories of the people behind the papers yes right um, without live petitioners it is difficult to humanize the story that is being told. Mm. Right? Courtrooms are set up as a theater of either human emancipation yes. or human degradation. But you have to tell that story. Um, and as litigators to have the privilege to represent these brave, brave people, uh, you know, in all the petitions this time around, you know, uh, where human beings came forth was really uh, a big, big, big asset. So, so I wasn't in court. I was in, in the studio when yeah. the judgment came out. But were there tears? Some cheering? I mean, you can't really make a lot of noise, but you know, was there a slightly emotional reaction <laughs> inside the courtroom? You know, so we're like, you know, so we're right up front. Yeah, yeah. we're right up front, right? Like we're the, yeah. like the, the, the first row of lawyers and the judges are looking at you as they're reading operative portions of their judgments. And the litigator's training is to keep a poker face, whether you're losing or you're winning. Uh, so we we kept poker faces because something kicks in, yeah. and you're hearing, as you said, Faye. I mean, you've read these judgments, and and we're hearing the judges deliver this live, uh, and it was really sort of. It was moving, right? Of course, right? Yes. They're, they're, it's a given, but that's the thing. It's exactly what you said. It fills you with hope yes. that this is our court, and therefore. Somewhere along the line, as a citizen, and not just as a litigator, as a citizen, I felt this is my court. As a country, we will be okay. Yes. You know, and this is not just 
this wonderful case on LGBT rights, this is a case where the court is saying only constitutional morality. Yeah. You will not bully people. You, you know, so that, so that would be, and this doesn't happen to me too often, uh, given the nature of the job, right? But uh, when we finished our prime time discussion, I just lay, you know, sort of leaned back at my in my chair and I said, "What a glorious time yeah. to be in this wonderful country yeah. Yeah. where something like this yeah. is possible and you can yeah. be part of it." And yeah. Yeah. we have this Supreme Court, and it's it's such a good feeling as, like you said, as a citizen yeah. to just feel what an awesome country yeah. we live in. Yeah, that yeah. This yeah. Is possible. True. So, yeah. and you know, we so all of a sudden, all the pain that we carried. Yeah. Unto that point, was sort yeah. of just dropped, and yeah. you just felt like, yeah. you know, you, like yeah. you said, it's okay. And for me, I, you know, we went back and we discussed this all day on the channel. We kept going back to that mm -hmm. point of the majority, and, and just to break it down, the majority yeah. morality or yes. whatever the majority opinion is, yeah. Yeah. cannot dictate to the minority. And the minority in this case can be one person. Yes, yeah. and that's Absolutely. the beauty of democracy. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and this for me. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, can apply to religion, yeah. to sexual orientation, Absolutely. to the way you dress, yeah. to the way you walk, to the way you talk, what you believe in, what yeah. you do when you work, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. And you're sort of, you know, hidden in like 498 pages. Yeah. It's, it's the cornerstone yeah. of democracy. Absolutely. Right? And Absolutely. It, so, and I, you know, the, the best part again about this sort of litigation is that this will get quoted now. Yeah. Yeah. By you know by lawyers for decades yeah. because this this yeah. is what it is for. Yeah. Yeah. So, how important was that one one sentence for you? The whole fact of the you know reinforcing what the minority wants yeah. or what the minority wants to believe. No, I think they've you know the bench has given uh, this this is an interpretation and an understanding of the constitution that is going to hold us in good stead for years to come. And I think that's really important. I mean, it's a, it's a vision of constitutional democracy. It's a vision of the role of the individual within the state where the individual is actually at the center of the constitutional scheme. And I think that has implications for all kinds of minorities, whether it's religious minorities, whether it's sexual minorities. But it really looks at reformulating how we see the individual in democracy. I mean, this is not, the individual has protections now against majorities and the court says that we are there to protect you. So I think that's been really important. And also any sort of, uh, and, and you know, any sort of call we might have right now, even the mention so much of a Hindu Rashtra or a Hindu mm -hmm. nation, which, yeah. which is happening, let's, I mean, yeah. we, and, and I think that mainstream should talk about this stuff mm -hmm. more. It's happening. If we read what the judges have said in no small terms in this judgment, it says very clearly that that's not on the cards. Yeah. That's not the country that we are. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, you know, th this is the Supreme Court reaffirming, restating, um, not just the constitutional pact that we have as citizens with each other, right? Uh, that we are a secular country, um, that here each individual has the right not to conform, mm -hmm. uh, whether that is in dress, whether that is of food, whether that is of identity, whether that is of faith, expression, uh, the judges talk about the ability to dissent. Uh, uh, when Ambedkar talked about constitutional morality, he was very clear, you know, he said, of course, you know, you will respect authority, but you will also criticize authority. That so is actually, a constitutional you know, just democracy. Just take a step, a step back so my audience can understand this better. Could you explain what constitutional morality yeah. is? So constitutional morality are the, uh, is a morality that is in place, that is shaped by the values of the constitution. What are those? Equality, dignity, non-discrimination, very important constitutional value. Life, liberty, it means that, you know, you cannot impose a food code, right? Uh, you cannot tell uh, citizens, uh, slice, a slice of society or citizens what to eat and what not to eat, right? Um, you cannot tell citizens what is the ideal faith, what is the ideal religion. You know, we are not that country. We did not make that choice when we were making, we were, we, when we were founding this country, the founders made a different choice. Especially since the 2013 judgment, yeah. which was heartbreaking, actually relied on this uh, premise that, I think only 300 cases. 
<laughs> so you're actually yeah. not, yeah. If you're not, you're yeah. not in, there aren't enough of you to matter. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose that was the most heartbreaking part of it. So yeah. this one idea that they, they needn't be enough of you to matter, one yeah. is enough yeah. to matter. Yeah. That sort of uh, reinforced perhaps all of the heartbreak that people felt in 2013. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the 2013 judgment was a deep blow. And I think, you know, it, it showed me that people take the court personally. Uh, the court is not an abstract institution, right? That it really matters to people that they are affected by um, by what the court says. It's not just that you wake up in the morning and you read the newspaper and you turn the page, but it really impacts you. And the way you see yourself, uh, the way you imagine that society sees you and that your, your country we sees had, you. You know, in a very real sense, we had cases of suicide and yeah. depression yeah. after sure. that 2013 sure. judgment. So, I mean, it's not just about how personally you take it, but it actually ended lives. Yeah. And was that a burden for you guys going into this again, saying that, you know, it's, you, you had, I mean, 6%, yeah. 7% of the population as your clients, <laughs> yeah. effectively. Yeah. Yeah. But you this know, it's scary. You know, I think actually having um, individuals as your clients is really scary. Yeah. You know, you have, so I mean, I, I, I'm, I think, you know, I saw this and I think I speak for Menika yeah. as well, but I saw this as a litigation that I would do, um, like any other litigation that I did where I had a client and my job was to defend my, my client. The 2013 sort of arguments and judgment and the, the, the difference this time was that it was not about the sex. Yeah. It was yeah. about yeah. everything else, right? It was about no. the lifestyle, yeah, yeah, it's about whether or not you can go to work, yeah. it's about whether or not you can yeah. go to college, whether or yeah. not you're getting bullied, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the GDP argument, which I thought was so charming. There was yeah. so much, it was, it was about yeah. everything else. It was everything. It was yeah. not about sex. So It was about life, yeah. you know, that as human yeah. beings, you know, there is, there are lives that are lived yeah. and yeah. lost lost because of living on the margins, right? And I think both that life, the joy of that life, and the loss that the, that the law was exacting on those lives, I think that was important to bring to court. Those were values, mm -hmm. uh, aspirations, um, that everyone in that courtroom got. So two really cool things. One is the Supreme Court has asked the government to publicize yeah. this judgment. Yeah. And, it's made it, and the government sort of you know, uh, while a lot of people I spoke to in the LGBT community were grateful that the government didn't make itself a hurdle yeah. and, and oppose, yeah. but the court sort of pulled up the government, Justice Chandrasekhar pulled up the government for not taking a side, saying you can't yeah. not take a side. Yeah. And just because you haven't taken a side doesn't mean we're not, you know, the court is not yeah. going to set this right. Yeah. So they've, the court has put the government sort of, uh, you know, in sure. the corner here mm -hmm. um, and said that this is, you have homework. Now, take this judgment and make sure everybody finds out about it. How important is that? Well, it's very important. I mean, the, uh, the dissemination of the values, I'd say, mm. that the judgment speaks about. And also for I mean, police officers, which is what Justice Nariman stressed on, to yeah. know about it, to know that this is a line that they can't cross anymore. I mean, a lot of the problems that people face on the ground are actually just police harassment. You know, and, and the fear that um, if you're open, that harassment will, will follow or prosecution will follow is really what stops you from living your life. So I think you know, the, the, the idea that the government in general is responsible for protecting rights, for disseminating this particular judgment and that that means the police in particular, I think that's really something that they've got right. In the you know, would, would the next step now be uh, sort of a version of Vishaka guidelines? in workspaces, in colleges, in schools to bring down the bullying, the harassment to, you know, for the LGBTQ community. Because it's, it's one thing to say that this is, you know, mm -hmm. the sexual orientation or the act of sex is now legal, mm -hmm. but people are still facing harassment. And yeah. we saw, you know, we, we now perhaps going to hear more stories about what happened, like we did, we heard in the Mahindra case. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, but I was just thinking, so this company decided to take action. Mm -hmm. But for any other organization, there is no rule, there is no mandate that you have to take action at this point. Should there be? So I think that uh, the first thing is that in the judgments, uh, the four judgments, um, one of the big, big wins, I think, out of this judgment is that Article 15, um, the Constitution's non-discrimination clause mm -hmm. will apply on grounds of sexual orientation also. 
Yes. So this means that the, the constitution says that you will not discriminate uh, on grounds of sex, religion, caste, creed, yes. so on and so forth. And now, sexual orientation. Right. sexual orientation. So that means that in every workspace um, in this country, um, if there is a supervisor thinking of firing someone on grounds of sexual orientation, stop, you can't, right? If you are thinking of harassing someone on grounds of sexual orientation, well, the workspace now has to do something about it. Um, so I think that so is the is workspace is obligated to do something about it? Yes, because now this is a constitutional value. Non sexual orientation is a prohibited marker of discrimination. Hmm. This is the constitutional value today in this country. Now workspaces have to respond to this, much like Mahindra has responded. Uh, and responded well, I think. But you know, and, and I'm glad I'm having this conversation with two women. The Vishaka guidelines, for example, yeah. came a while ago, but it has taken us, yeah. you know, time in every organization yeah. to educate people. In, you know, yeah. this is okay, this is not okay. Yeah. This is harassment, this is not harassment. For both the women and the men, um, and then I feel that, uh, at least I personally feel it's necessary for organizations to know what is the step forward. Yeah. Because a lot of times it's like, chodna. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. it's not so bad. Yeah. I'll move you to a different team. Yeah. It'll be yeah. okay. Yeah. So and so is a valued member of the organization. Yeah. They don't want to ruin his life. So on one hand, the understanding yeah. that the discrimination is no longer, but I, an individual is not going to approach the courts for justice yeah. every time, or they can't approach the yeah. courts. Mm -hmm. So is there a need, or do you think that perhaps some of us should start driving a, a, a guidebook of some, some yeah. sort to tell people what sort of harassment you know, you're not what sort of harassment, but what constitutes yeah. harassment yeah. and what doesn't. Yeah. I think, you know, there, there are two things, right? One is exactly as you're saying, that there are, you know, people who are in positions where they can do that and change organizational culture. But I think the other big thing ha that happens is that individuals themselves change, right? So, I mean, after sexual harassment, um, initially Vishakha, but then the statute came into force, the, the difference is also that now women know what to call it. Yes. You know, it's not just this vague sense of unease of is this okay, is this not okay. There's a word for it and, and you, you know, you, you know it when you, when you see it because there's a name for it. So I think change happens on both sides and one is institutional cultures change and that can take time and, and, and that's a process and I understand that. But I think the other big change that happens is that the people on the other side change because they know that they have rights they know that there's a name for this and that it's not okay. And today, you know, thanks to the Supreme Court, it's, it's not okay because the Supreme Court says it's not okay. And the Supreme Court says that the Constitution is there to protect you. So, you know, um, we've gotten a lot of questions about, you know, the, the court has said this and will society change um, and so on, right? And organizational culture and workspaces are a part of that in a sense. But, um, but I think what also happens is that individuals change. And that's really important. The court has given us a way to empower individuals to do that. Which is the other very important part of this judgment for the fact that it was read down and not struck down. Yeah. And again, uh, there were members within the community uh, of LGBTQ uh, who felt that there is, no, there is no law in our country right now on, that prevents the rape of a man yeah. by another man. Sure. Yeah. And that's an important part to acknowledge that now you know, in yeah. the read down version of 377, yeah. there is a law. It's that's clear right. and, and yeah. you know, because we had people in the studio who had been abused and raped Absolutely. and had nowhere to go. Absolutely. So if, if you could explain to our audience again, yeah. you know, what this means yeah. technically based yeah. on, on the read down version. No, so 377 as it now exists in, uh, in the penal code will only apply one to situations like this, non-consensual sexual activity the rape, for instance, of a man by another man. So this is still an offense, as it should be. Um, so that, that still applies. And of course, bestiality, hmm. you know. Um, but I do think that, you know, this does call for, a, a, you know, a, a, a more thoughtful conversation. Why yes. don't we have yes. a rape law uh, that embraces within its fold? Uh, is is there a necessity here to make the rape law gender neutral or do you think it needs to be a separate law that is written differently? You know, I, I think that as a country we have been slow to re realize and recognize that men get raped. Mm. You know, uh, somewhere along the line I think it impinges on our sense of yes. what is masculinity. Yes. 
yes. you know. Uh, and I think it's been very unfortunate um, mm. because I think it has been hurtful for male survivors. So that we have no data at all yeah. on male survivors yeah. of rape. Yeah. Now, just in the last year or so, we've now got data about the fact that among the children who are abused in our country, below yeah. the age of 18, 52% are boys. Yeah. Wow. 52% wow. are yeah. boys. Yeah. And so, if you just extrapolate, there is no yeah. reason why the numbers are not similar for young adults for also young adults. adults. Yeah, absolutely. So, there's, you know, the fact that we haven't even acknowledged or studied yeah. this part of, uh, you know, yeah. of crime yeah. at yeah. all. Yeah. It, it's shocking to imagine yeah. what that person must have to deal We've with. We've just been so poor in our responses to sexual violence. Um, you know, uh, it is just, you know, uh, that there, there is something uh, just so bewildering about the lack of effort that the Indian state has made, the not spending the Nirbhaya funds. I, I mean, there's like a long litany, you know, yes. um, uh, the pandemic of gang rapes in, in a certain belt, marital, marital yeah. rape, the unwillingness of the political community across the board. But you know, you think this, about marital this rape. is the thing um, the whole argument that marital rape is difficult to quantify legally in our country. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. I yeah. mean, you have politicians right now who are working on projects on how to bring down population. Mm -hmm. Start here. Mm -hmm. Give a woman the right to say no to yeah. her husband. Yeah. 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 And if yeah. you want to bring down population, that should be the first step. But I, I, legally, do you, I mean, I haven't understood it personally mm -hmm. on how it will be difficult to sort of quantify marital rape legally in our country because of the culture. Do you understand it? Do either no, of you I, understand I, what I, that means? I'm just bewildered by the argument, uh, you know. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've been on a, a show before where mm -hmm. the only thing that united the political spectrum of parties was, was that they said yeah. no law. Yeah. Uh, and and it's, it's really like mind boggling because one, you want to ask them, so this is your understanding of marriage? Yeah. That, you know, a man will rape and men, aren't you offended? Yeah. You know, uh, but it's, it's, you know, I, again, it's part of this problem, right? Yeah, but, you know, their argument is that, you know, if he's beating her, mm -hmm. then there's a domestic violence um, you know, law yeah. that looks after that. If he's not beating her, then yeah. that's marriage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I suppose there's, there's like a lack of understanding of, you know, the area that we're, yeah. we're actually talking about. Yeah. And how are we ever going to bring them around? Yeah. A lack of understanding of the integrity and dignity of every person, including wives here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a very simple thing. Like, every citizen in India is constantly, constitutionally empowered with dignity. There is no exclusionary clause for Indian wives. Yeah. And, and this whole, the, the, the loophole right now uh, about, um, it is rape, the, the, the rape law, mm -hmm. 370, it is rape unless he is married to her and she's below the age of 15. Mm -hmm. So you can be married to a 16 year old in this country yeah. Yeah. and you could be raping that 16 year old every yeah. night and as per our law that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I mean it's it's a it's a problem one because you know child marriage is actually rampant um, and so you you wonder what kind of protections we have for actually people who are Children, I mean, you know, they are covered under POXO, they're still under 18. But also I think it, it you know, it, it makes you, uh, or I think the political class then or lawmakers then have to be introspective about their own relationships. You know, it, it means that mm. you need to think about what we think of as marriage. You know, yeah. what is that, um, what is that relationship, what is it supposed to entail? Yeah. What is equality and dignity in the context of, of marriage? I mean, this is not an institution which is removed from people's lives. So how cool is it that we've gone, or uh, the judgments have gone from quoting philosophers to quoting music lyrics? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I think we're, we're sort of, uh, you know, you have these beautiful, yeah. elegant judgments. Um, and I loved Leonard Cohen. Um, yeah. uh, being quoted in court. Uh, you know, it's just such a proud time for me as a lawyer. You know, these are cool judges. Yeah. Uh, these are learned judges. They're erudite. Um, I, I think if you are a young Indian today saying, well, what should I become? Mm -hmm. I'd be become a lawyer. Consider becoming a judge. There's so much you can do. Yes. And there's something you can do 
which so few are able to do in India today. You can inspire. Yes. You know, uh, and I think our court inspired us. And the thing? I thought the music was cool, but you know, <laughs> I mean, m more than it, uh, it being cool, I think there was so much empathy. Yeah. I mean, you know, to hear that um, yeah. history has to, uh, you know, history owes an apology yeah. to LGBT people and their families. I mean, yes. that, that is so important. Yes. I mean, to recognize yeah. that, you know, families go through this whole process with you. I mean, there's, yeah. there's, a, there's a learning curve, there's, there's an acceptance. And, you know, I mean, we are very much embedded in our families, right? I mean, family life is important to us. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so to hear that, I think it was, in, you know, it, it's very affirming. And, um, and I think that really marks the, the judgment. You know, uh, yeah. the evening that, uh, the, the, the way the judgment came out, we actually did one hour of programming between 8 and 9 o'clock at night, yeah. where we had parents yeah. wow. of yeah, uh, members of the community who talked lovely. about what it was like when their kids came out yeah. to them, yeah. uh, who talked about what it was like to tell the extended family the yeah. fear yeah. they dealt with. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them yeah. dealt with fear, some of them didn't. Yeah. And how they, yeah. you know, they talked about how um, Hari Shire's mom talked about how she felt fear for her son's physical safety mm -hmm. every yeah. time he left the house. Sure. Yeah. Because he was open about his orientation. Sure. He was an activist, he was yeah. not an activist, and she just felt he was constantly in danger. And she said, I lived yeah. in fear. Yeah. Every time he would leave the house, I would call to make sure that, he, have you reached? Are you okay? Where have you gone? Yeah. Something, something, something. So th for them also, the relief of that fear being taken yeah. away. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. You know, the, yeah. So, it was a it was a massive massive day for all of us and uh, i loved what you said about the fact that you know it's a great time to be a young person in this country yeah. it's a great time yeah. to be inspired yeah. by a document like this one so if you guys are wondering what to read over the weekend. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's 500 pages. It is 500 pages, but it's really not as intimidating as it looks. Yes. Um, I would really It's easily it. available on the internet. Yes. Yeah. And yes. I'm assuming it, a hardbound copy will be available eventually, but don't wait. Read yeah. at least yeah. some portions of it yeah. Yeah. over the weekend. Yeah. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Chat with Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you again with the, for the time. And I wish you very, very good luck. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Big Thank changes you. yet to be made. Yes. And yes. I hope to see you at the forefront of Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.